tonight on the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast, Joe Rayo at the Kings and Daughters Library in Haverstraw, New York, and it's all about the 2024 solar eclipse, and that gets started shortly, and that's our feature tonight. This is the first for the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast as we are taking Joe's uh, presentation at the library live all the way through. And the Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast is always brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system. Join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is pinned to the description of this podcast. Use the coupon code WINTER2324. And if you do, you will get 10% off. And there's Joe Rayo waiting. Um, he will be, be starting shortly. So I just wanted to start just a couple of minutes, bring you up a couple of minutes early on the screen so that everybody can see uh, that uh, there's Joe Rayo in his office. And this is uh, this is kind of exciting for, for me because this is, I have to do all the technical stuff to put this together and it actually worked and so far so good. Uh, well, good evening to everybody on the chat board tonight. Hope that you can hear me well. Um, welcome to tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast, and we're going to try to do this from time to time and maybe figure out a few other special things we can do. Uh, it's not the library talker, Tim. It's me. It's Joe. Uh, so uh, for those of you lurking in the background, uh, you can join the chat board by subscribing to my YouTube channel and turning your notifications on, and this way you can join in on the conversation. And if you like tonight's show, by all means, hit the like button. So I am going to um, pause at this point, and we're going to let Joe eventually take it away when he gets started. So everybody just be patient. The show should begin shortly. Hi, it's 6.31. I don't know if we want to give it another minute or two, or um, we have, um, looks like we have six people here so far. Can you hear me, Joe? I'm all set to go if uh, you'd sure. like Sure, yeah, why not? All righty. So for all of you who are tuned in right now, uh, my name is Joe Rayo. I've been here before. I, I, I think I've given something like three or four talks for the uh, uh, library here, the Haverstor King King's Daughters Library, public library. 
Uh, this is uh, the second talk that I'm giving about the upcoming eclipse. The first talk was about some of my adventures chasing these things around the world, but tonight we're specifically going to talk about the, uh, the eclipse itself and uh, all the things that I guess you need to know uh, in advance of this spectacular event that's coming our way one week from this coming Monday. It's getting closer and closer and closer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share my screen with everybody. This is going to be, as, all, as is the case with all the others, a uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'll get to the slideshow, and we'll start from the beginning here. And again, I want to thank uh, the uh, Haverstor King's Daughters Library again for inviting me to give a presentation. And we're going to talk about uh, a celestial play, if you will, or maybe we could call it a, a dance. If you, in the French language, it would be known as a pas de trois, a dance of three. Uh, the uh, first dancer is, of course, us, we here on the planet Earth, but also dancing with us is that object that you have seen in the sky these last few nights, uh, that big, beautiful moon, the full moon on Monday night. And uh, the moon, many hundreds and thousands of years ago, was thought to be actually a goddess, a goddess by the name of Selene. Selene, uh, which uh, ruled over the moon at night, and during the day, we have another object. This is number three in our list of three, and that is the most important. That, of course, is the sun. The sun, which uh, you see here on the screen here, the part that we normally see, uh, 864,000 miles across, uh, and all gas from its surface to its center, gas clear in through its entirely hot central regions, 11,000 degrees on the surface, almost 30 million degrees at its center. Gas, nonetheless, all the way through. Gas so dense that the average weight of a small amount of it, a, a cubic centimeter of it, is uh, heavier than the weight of an equal amount of water. If it were not for the sun, you wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here, nobody on this planet would be here, for it supplies us with all the heat and all the light and all the energy. We thought the sun actually was related to a god by the name of Apollo. Apollo carried the sun across the sky, so we were told, in a chariot. He would emerge from the eastern part of the sky in the morning and then climb high, high into the sky, reaching its highest point at midday. And then the chariot and its accompanying horses would gallop down toward the western sky and disappear beyond the western horizon uh, at nightfall. And then the whole cycle would start again the following day. So we knew, at least sky gazers and star watchers knew, that the sun and the moon were very, very important. And we had to treat them with tender, loving care. If anything were to happen to them, especially the sun, we would be in big, big trouble. And occasionally, something did happen to both the sun and the moon. That phenomenon, which we know as an eclipse, the people who lived hundreds and thousands of years ago, though, thought that an eclipse was cause for alarm, that the sun and the moon were being eaten by some invisible monster up in the sky. I find it very appropriate, by the way, that this year is uh, the Chinese New Year of the Year of the Dragon, because this is a very appropriate story that I'm about to tell to all of you. The earliest solar eclipse on record goes back to the Chinese uh, way, way back, and we'll tell you how far back in just a moment. I don't speak Chinese, but I do know the story, and now I'm going to relate it to all of you. And that story goes as follows. The day was bright. The great sun hung motionless in the sky above the Yangtze Valley. The Chinese storytellers record what happened next. The dragon, Lung, restless with hunger, appeared. And before the eyes of the frightened people, Lung began to devour the sun. The day grew darker. The people raised a din, a chant, the prayers. The dragon was startled. He desisted. The sun slipped from his jaws and Lung banished to wait another chance. Our computers give us the date. It was October 22nd in the year 2137 BC. Now, let me just back up a bit here. And we're gonna just go through that one more time. I'm sorry about that, my, my finger got twitchy. So we, we know about Lung, we know about the dragon, that supposedly devoured the sun. And uh, again, this, this first 
record of a solar eclipse in the Chinese records, the Chinese chronicles, go back all the way to 2137 BC. So nearly 4,000 years ago was the first record of a solar eclipse. Now, the rarity of what happened on that day and what is going to happen over North America on April 8th of this year is explained by the fact that the moon does not orbit the sun or the moon does not orbit the earth in the same plane as the earth orbits the sun. If it did, the moon's shadow would pass across the earth every month. Instead, the moon's orbit is tilted just a little bit. So when the high side of its orbit is toward the sun, the moon's shadow passes above the earth and we don't have a solar eclipse. However, later in the year, when the earth has revolved to a position on the other side of the sun, the low side of the moon's orbit is toward the sun and the moon's shadow then passes below the earth. Again, no eclipse. But when the Earth is midway between these two positions, the orbit of the Moon can bring it into line between the Sun and the Earth, and the result is what we're going to see a week from this Monday, the shadow of the Moon passing across the Earth. Now that particular event of 2137 BC is noteworthy by the fact that the two guys who were supposed to warn the Chinese people of this event uh, the guy on the left was named Hai, and the guy on the right is Ho. These two guys were the court astronomers in China. Their job was to watch over the skies at night and during the day as well. If anything unusual were to happen, they had to alert the emperor, and the emperor in turn would alert the people. Uh, so if they saw something unusual in the nighttime sky, like well, what the Chinese refer to as a broom star or a comet or a guest star, what we call a nova, a star that suddenly appears and then just as quickly disappears over a matter of a few nights. Especially important was to watch for eclipses, to watch for the, the dragon devouring the sun, to give a heads up on that and to uh, inform everybody that it was time to beat the drums, shoot rockets into the sky, to try to chase the dragon away. But for reasons that we will never know, Hai and Ho, the night before the eclipse of 2137 BC, decided to have a little party. And uh, they uh, had a few drinks. In fact, more than a few drinks. In fact, they over imbibed. I'll say it quite nicely. They became inebriated, so much so that they fell asleep. And they stayed asleep all the way through the next day, the day of the eclipse. And so the sun was almost completely covered by the time people noticed and suddenly realized that the dragon was eating the sun and so they went through the usual ritual of beating drums and screaming and you know trying to chase the dragon away which they ultimately did but then we had an emperor the chinese emperor who was very very upset and he called high and ho to his uh, throne room and uh, reprimanded them he said you know what you we almost lost the sun today because you two guys didn't tell us about the eclipse you didn't warn us of what was happening up in the sky. We had to find out for ourselves. And because of the fact that you two were, at the, were basically asleep at the wheel, you are going to have to pay the ultimate price. And that ultimate price was, well, you can see this one gentleman here with a rather long, I don't know if you'd call it a saber or certainly a large knife. <laughs> Remember the line in Crocodile Dundee? That's not a knife, mate. This is a knife. Well. The knife was put to some use that following day, and High and Ho felt it. They were uh, beheaded, decapitated, and they indeed paid the price for not warning everybody about that solar eclipse all those years ago. But this is not an isolated case. We have, in other uh, different cultures, people who, upon seeing an eclipse, either the moon or the sun, looked up to the sky and uh, went through the usual machinations, as one would expect. You see these two guys down here. Uh, hurtling uh, uh, spears up toward the sun, trying to chase away the animal that was uh, devouring it. In other cultures, it wasn't a dragon. It might have been a pig or a goat. In one particular culture, an eclipse of the moon was thought to be a giant frog eating the, the moon. But whatever, we know that this went on all through the world whenever an eclipse took place. Uh, one particular theory was written by someone anonymously, uh, that person wrote in a limerick, sometimes I think of the sun and the moon as lovers who rarely meet, always chase, and almost always miss one another. 
but once in a while they do catch up and they kiss, and the world stares in awe of their eclipse. I would suppose from this description that this is what supposedly was happening up in the sky during an eclipse. That's right, Celine and Apollo, I guess you could say getting it on, or at least uh, giving each other a nice big smooch. And meanwhile, down here on the earth, we mere mortals, using our instruments, our telescopes, our cameras, our binoculars, uh, looking up, gazing, and recording what was happening up in the sky at this amazing celestial site. Well, this is, this, this is uh, the, the, the main reason that we eventually learned how to predict eclipses. Because whereas, let's say 4,000 years ago, eclipses were pretty much unpredictable. We thought that they occurred helter-skelter at, at any given time. But we learned from keeping records of every eclipse of the sun and moon over decades, over centuries, over millennia, that eventually a, a cycle began to appear out of the records. This particular uh, tablet in Babylon, Babylonia uh, of an eclipse that occurred in the year 630 BC. And again, after a number of these eclipses took place and records were built up, we discovered that there was a very definite cycle going on in association with eclipses. Now, here is probably one of the very first solar and lunar eclipse computers, believe it or not. This giant monument, which I'm sure all of you have seen, either in books or on television or in magazines, this still stands in uh, Salisbury, England, is Stonehenge. Stonehenge, and I, you know, I look at this and I say to myself, how in the world did they do it? How did the, the ancients construct something like this? For example, these two stones, this one and this one, placed atop these two stones, which served, I guess, as a pedestal or something. I mean, these two stones had to weigh, you know, at least a few hundred tons. And yet, somehow or other, they managed to get these stones up on top. And when the Stonehenge was new, it probably looked something like this. Now, it was built in six stages between the years 3000 and 1500 BC during the transition from the Neolithic period to the Bronze Age. And British astronomer Gerald Hawkins wrote two articles for the very reputable science journal Nature in 1963 and 1964, in which he pointed out several new Stonehenge alignments to the sun and the moon and proposed that the Aubrey holes, yes, take a look here on this uh, artist's view of what Stonehenge may have looked like when it was completed. There were holes located around the periphery, two sets of them actually here and also here. What were these holes for? The Aubrey holes, as they were called, according to Hawkins, were used as markers to predict eclipses. His popular book, which uh, came out of those two uh, uh, articles he wrote for Nature, uh, the book Stonehenge Decoded, gave the world the idea that this monument was actually a Neolithic computer that was used to predict eclipses. Now, Anyone who had the power to make a prediction about an eclipse coming up was a very powerful person. The soothsayers, the necromancers, the astrologers of, you know, one, two, three thousand years ago, they looked to the sky, they were able to read what was happening in the sky, and they felt that the movements of the sun, moon, and especially the planets, the planets too were thought to be gods, certainly they were named after ancient deities, and they somehow were able to coerce or convince the people that by tracking the positions of these celestial objects on a night-to-night -night basis, that they could predict the future. They could tell what was going on. And even to this day, here we are in the 21st century and virtually every newspaper that's published in the United States, every newspaper, well, not everyone, but most newspapers have a column that might cover a half a page or maybe even sometimes almost a whole page of horoscopes done by people who portray themselves as astrologers uh, in the pseudoscience of astrology. So even today, people believe the motions of the planets have something to do with the future for their life and maybe the future of their uh, country. But, you know, that's that's that was the way people were thinking, you know, many hundreds and thousands of years ago. So these people, the astrologers, were very, very important, and especially if they read and find out 
uh, and determine when an eclipse was going to occur. Then they would go up to the emperor or the king or the queen and say, hey, you know what? A week from this coming Monday, the dragon is coming and is going to eat the sun. And the emperor, the king or the queen would immediately tell everybody in the, uh, in, in the kingdom about that and they'd be ready to, to fire up their rockets and to chase that uh, animal or dragon away. Well, the cycle, one of the cycles that was derived from keeping records of eclipses over all of those years is the Saros cycle, derived from the Greek word for repetition. Um, and, you know, you, you, for example, you say, you know, you turn on your TV in October or September and you watch one of your favorite TV shows, right? And then all of a sudden you watch the same show, you see this very same show you saw in September, October, in uh, May, June or July. It is being rerun again. It's a summer rerun. Well, believe it or not, eclipses rerun, eclipses recur. And it was derived from the Saros cycle, the observations of all those past eclipses. Eclipses will recur every 18 years, 10 or 11 days. If over that 18 year time span in question, there were five leap years, then it would be 11 days. And if there were only four leap years in that 18 year time frame, then it would be 10. So 18 years, 10 or 11 days, that's when eclipses would repeat, would recur. Here's an example. This is a map of an eclipse of the sun. There's a total eclipse of the sun that occurred in July, July the 20th, 1963. Notice, if you will, on the map, the zone of visibility of the eclipse. This is where you would see a partial eclipse. This whole area here, that's where the outer shadow of the moon, the penumbra, falls on the surface of the earth. The penumbra is a shadow measuring about 6,000 miles across. So. In this particular case, you see the shadow falling upon North America and a part of Asia. And you also see these lines. The blue lines indicate how much of the sun is going to be covered by the moon. For example, along this blue line that you see here, that's the 25% line. So on that day, July 20th, 1963, you would have seen a partial eclipse of the sun in Los Angeles amounting to 25% coverage. No, 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 no big deal. This second blue line is the 50% line. And wherever that line landed, and in this case, it passed over Miami, so you would have seen a 50% eclipse in Miami that day. Here's the 75% line. And this blue path that you see here, that blue path is the path of the total eclipse, the path of totality. From this area right here, this, this path, if you were anywhere along this zone, you would have seen a total eclipse of the sun. Now in 1963, the path was only about 55 miles wide and you would have seen a total eclipse lasting for about a minute and 40 seconds. So that's the place you wanted to be. At local sunrise over Northern Japan, Hokkaido, Japan, that's where the path of the eclipse started. Then moving at thousands of miles an hour, the uh, shadow would move across the North Pacific Ocean, then made contact again, this time with Alaska, and then crossed over into Canada. And then before moving out over the Atlantic Ocean, it moved through the state of Maine before moving out over the Atlantic and coming to an end in the North Atlantic Ocean several hours after it started. So this whole area here was the partial eclipse. This is the total eclipse. Now, for the Saros to work, take a look up here, 1963. We said the Saros amounted to 18 years. So add 18 years to 1963 and you get 1981. There were five leap years during that 18 year time frame. So we have to add 11 days. So 11 days July 20th is July 31st. Ronnie Wynn, I'm, I, if you can hear me, could you? Yeah, thank you. She, uh, I asked him to uh, please uh, mute your uh, microphone because we were hearing all kinds of bangs and noises there. So anyway, that Sarah cycle that I mentioned, 1963, July 20th, Add 18 years and 11 days to that, and that would bring us to 1981, July 31st. So that would mean that on July 31st, 1981, the Saros would indicate that the shadow track and paths would recur, would once again fall upon the earth in basically the same manner that they did in 1963. And look at this, 1981, July 31st, here again is the broad area of the zone of partial eclipse. Here are the blue lines indicating 
percentages of the partial eclipse here. And there's the path of totality, taking basically the same kind of trek across the Earth that it did in 1963. But there's something changed. There's a difference between 63 and 81. What is it? In 1963, the eclipse was passing mostly over North America. But in 1981, the eclipse is now passing not over North America, but over Asia. Where's North America? It's over here. Well, you may remember when I first introduced the Saro cycle to you, I said 18 years, 11 and a third days. In other words, during that time frame, the Earth turns on its axis one third of the way around, 120 degrees, eight hours. So uh, when the shadow returned and fell upon the surface of the Earth in 1981, the Earth had turned one third of the way on its axis. Here is North America. But now the main views are going to be over, well, the eclipse track started now, not over Japan, but over the Middle East. It moved across Mongolia, Siberia, north of Japan, and finally finished several hours later in the Pacific Ocean, north of the Hawaiian Islands. And that's how the Saros works. Every 18 plus years, the shadows of the moon would fall on the surface of the Earth, basically the same way that they did 18 years previous, but because of the fact that the Earth is turning, and again, over that 18 year time span, it has turned one third of the way on its axis, different parts of the globe are experiencing the same type of an eclipse. But there's yet another cycle. This is called the Exiglimos, the triple Saros. What's a triple Saros? Well, multiply 18 by three. And you know what you come up with? 54. And if you uh, multiply 11 or 12 days by three, you come up with 32 days, plus or minus a day. This special cycle is called the turning of the wheel. And indeed, over a 54 year time span, the Earth has turned all the way around. Again, every 18 years, it turns 120 degrees. So after three turns or 54 years, the shadows are going to return basically to the same part of the globe that it caused an eclipse 54 years previous. Now, I'm not going to ask you to remember Exiglimos or Triple Saros, but I do want you to remember this. Remember this number, 54. It's going to play a role in what we're going to be witnessing here a week from this Monday. So remember that number, 54, if you will. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. Now, what in the world is this? This piece of junk, and it does look like a piece of junk, but actually what it is is a very important part of history. What you're looking at may have been one of the very first computers that had ever been built. This is called the anti kathaya mechanism, and it's an ancient Greek hand-powered model of the solar system described as the oldest known example of an analog computer to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. Now, the reason why it looks the way it does is that it was found among the wreckage from a shipwreck off the Greek island of Antikythaya in 1901. And its construction relied on theories of astronomy and mathematics developed by Greek astronomers, and it's estimated to have been built around 200 BC. So there you go. This computer was built around 200 BC. Short while later, it was lost in a shipwreck, stayed below the ocean surface for a good number of years, a good number of centuries, until it was finally recovered again in 1901. And you can see what happens when you leave uh, something like that uh, underwater for about 2,000 years. It can get awfully corroded. In 2008, that was back about, what, 15, 16 years ago, a team from a British university used computer X-ray tomography and high-resolution scanning to image the inside fragments of this crust-encased mechanism and was able to read faint inscriptions that covered the outer casing. This suggested that it had 37 meshing bronze gears to calculate the positions of the five classical planets, follow the irregular orbit of the moon, the movement of the sun through the zodiac, as well as to predict eclipses. And in fact, these uh, English or British astronomers were able to actually build a replica of what this was like when it was brand new. And here it is. Presumably, in 200 BC, the Anthakathaya mechanism looks something like this. A couple of cranks, lots of gears, inscriptions that showed the movements of the sun, moon, planets in the sky. And this, again, may have been one of the very first, if not the first, analog computers 
which sadly was lost in a shipwreck, how science and astronomy might have moved forward much more quickly if this had managed to survive and this uh, had been around you know, beyond uh, the time after the shipwreck. But in any case, an amazing device that was developed by Greek uh, astronomers, you know, again, 2,000, two millennia ago. And today in our 21st, I challenge you uh, tomorrow or whenever you have a chance, when you're walking down the main street of your, of your house, uh, your home, your neighborhood, stop a number of people and ask them this simple question. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, ma'am. You know, in the sky, the moon, sometimes it looks like a, a full moon and sometimes it looks like a half moon or a crescent moon or sometimes you can't see it at all. Why is that? Why does that happen? Can you explain that to me? <laughs> and I guarantee you, in nine out of ten cases, in fact, maybe in all ten cases, the, the response will be, oh, oh, well, yeah, uh, it has something to do with the, the moon going around the sun or maybe around the earth. Or I, I learned that back in high school. I don't, I don't know. And that's sadly the state of science in the, for many people in this world today, in this 21st century world. And yet, when we talk about the dark ages, when we talk about people who were living 2,000 years ago and say, oh, they didn't know anything, did they? Look, they were able to create this amazing device that showed the movements of the sun, moon, and planets and predict eclipses all those many years ago. I have a feeling the people who lived thousands of years ago were a heck of a lot sharper and smarter in some cases maybe in many cases, than the people who live in our modern space age world today. And probably among historical eclipses, the most famous eclipse of ancient time, the most famous solar or sun eclipse, actually ended a five-year war between two warring Middle East factions, the Lydians and the Medes. These two Middle Eastern armies were locked in a fierce battle which seemingly was never going to end when suddenly the day was turned into night and the sight of this total solar eclipse, which we now know occurred on May 28, 585 BC, was startling enough to cause both nations to cease hostilities at once. And they agreed to a peace treaty and cemented the bond with a double marriage. Wouldn't it be great if the eclipse coming up a week from Monday was happening over the Ukraine? Would that stop the war? Probably not. In fact, I know it wouldn't. It wouldn't do it today, but, you know, back in 585, a good old-fashioned total eclipse of the sun just in the right spot at the right time was able to stop a full-scale war. Another famous eclipse was of the moon, and this moon eclipse involved this guy, which you learned about, I'm sure, in elementary and grammar school. Uh, just to give you a hint, he, uh, he sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Christopher Columbus, yes. Although Columbus did not sail on one voyage, he sailed on three uh, to the New World. And the third voyage is where he almost met his end. Because in the year 1503, he found himself stranded on the island of Jamaica. His ships were damaged and beyond repair. Now, at first, he and his crew were able to get food and water from the natives. And the natives gave Columbus food and uh, supplies in exchange for little baubles, little trinkets, little chachas, chachkas. For example, you could see here Columbus showing the natives a bell. And the natives must have certainly found this most interesting. They never saw anything like that before. My goodness, can we have that? And Columbus, of course, said, sure, I, I'm gladly, you, know, you can have the bell. We have other things that you've never seen before. As long as you supply us with food and water, you can have anything you'd like. And Columbus felt in his mind that a rescue caravel from Europe was probably on its way to rescue him and his crew. It'd probably be a few weeks. So they would be on Jamaica for a few weeks. And uh, meanwhile, the uh, natives were supplying Columbus with food and water. Well, as the days turned into weeks and the weeks stretched into months, the Jamaicans finally refused to supply any more food or water to Columbus. I mean, they, you know, what are we, slaves? You know, you, you get your own food, get your own water. We're, we're tired of this game that you've been playing with us. And now, not only are the natives angry at Columbus, but Columbus's own crew was ready to turn against him. You know, hey, you, you said we were going to be rescued. That was like like months ago. What, are, you know, are we going to be stuck here for the rest of our lives? So now, faced with the prospect of both starvation 
and mutiny, the great Italian admiral conceived of an ingenious plan. Like any good sailor, Columbus had navigational tables that he consulted, and he noted from the tables that there was going to be a total eclipse of the moon that was going to commence right after the moon rose on the last night of February in 1504. So, he arranged a meeting with the natives just prior to sunset that evening and just prior to moonrise and the start of the eclipse, and he announced that because he didn't like the way they were treating him and his crew, that the Almighty had now decided to permanently remove the moon as a sign of his displeasure. Now, whether or not the natives believed Columbus, Columbus timed his theatrics precisely because no sooner did he proclaim the moon's disappearance, but the moon appeared above the eastern horizon and began to move into the shadow of the earth and had a bite taken out from it. Well, as you can imagine, the natives were terrified. As the moon gradually diminished, they pleaded with Columbus to restore it. Oh, please bring, bring the moon back. We need the moon. We love the moon. The moon gives us light at night. Please don't take it away from us now. We promise. We promise we'll bring you all the supplies, all the food, all the water you want, but only please bring the moon back. And Columbus, you know, seeing that he had now the natives in the palm of his hand, said, you know, you people were very nice to us when we first arrived here many months ago. And uh, we, you know, gave you some interesting little baubles and trinkets and you brought all the food and then you stopped. That's what angered my God. But now I'm going to be on your side. I'm going to go back into my quarters on the ship and I'm going to discuss this with the Almighty and uh, try my level best. I, I can't make any promises, but I'm going to try to convince him to bring the moon back. So that's what he did. He did have to retire to his quarters. And he said, I'm going to try to convince God, his God, to bring back the moon. And what was his God? You remember anybody who saw the movie The Wizard of Oz, you certainly know what this is. You remember in the movie when uh, the Wicked Witch said to Dorothy, <laughs> That's how much time you have to live. And it's not long, my pretty. Well, in this case with Columbus, all he was using with that simple hourglass on his ship was timing out the duration of the total phase of the eclipse. So several minutes just before the end of the total phase, he stepped back outside and announced to the natives that his God had pardoned them and he would allow the moon to return to its proper place in the sky. And guess what? Sure enough, it did. The moon began to emerge from the Earth's shadow, and Columbus, as you would well imagine, had no more problem with the Jamaicans, who gratefully supplied Columbus and his men with all the food and supplies they needed until finally that rescue caravel arrived from Europe to take them all home. Now, this story, a very famous historic story, was read by many people. One of the people who especially found it interesting was this gentleman, Samuel Clemens, who we all know today as Mark Twain, and we all know Mark Twain. He wrote about um, Tom Sawyer, Becky Thatcher, Huckleberry Finn, but he also wrote other stories as well. In fact, some of you may remember the great eclipse story that he wrote in his 1889 book, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. The book was made, believe it or not, into one of the very first talking pictures way back in the year 1931. And the legendary humorist, Will Rogers, you remember Will Rogers? He once said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, Will Rogers was the star of the movie. He played the part of a 20th century Yankee who had been sent back in time to the days of King Arthur. And now he's about to be burned at the stake by King Arthur as an evil sorcerer. But he has one last hope. Looking at a little black book he carries, he discovers there will be a total eclipse of the sun at high noon. In this case, uh, Mark Twain used the sun for an eclipse and not the moon as Columbus did. So he tells, uh, Mark, uh, 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 Will Rogers tells King Arthur, if you don't release me, oh, woe is you, I'm, I'm going to take away the sun. Here's how that went in the movie. Hey, King, you better turn us loose right away. Because if you don't, I'm sure going to put the old Yankee curse on you.
magician, mightiest of wizards, we humbly beseech thy mercy. Name thy terms, even to the half my kingdom, but restore the sun to the All right, Artie. You know, you, you're not a bad fellow at heart, and, I, and I'll see what I can do for you, you know, but, but I'll do the best I can. Coolidge! Hova! Rockney! And Al Smith! of miracles, all homage to him who hath brought back the sun. Hip, hip, hooray for, for Will Rogers. He brought the sun back, and I can tell you from the story that he had no more problems with King Arthur and his, uh, and his people after that. But you know, the science of eclipses is all based upon one thing, shadows. Maybe some of you remember the poem by Robert Louis Stevenson. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what could be the use of him is more than I can see. Sometimes, in fact, you can get an eclipse of the sun in the strangest places, and sometimes it occurs uh, most unexpectedly. Nobody w would anticipate it. For example, just something like that happened a few years ago during one of the divisional baseball playoff games in San Francisco, a game between the Giants and the Washington Nationals. Watch the eclipse of the sun that happened on the field that day, and listen also to the play-by-play -play announcers as uh, this event took place. Be a big pitch for Madison. And with a strange shadow being cast mid-pitch as a result of a blimp or a plane flying overhead, it's two balls and a strike to LaRoche. Even Adam had to look up and say, what is going on here? That would be the blimp. The lights went out. No clouds. Beautiful sunny day. It's hard enough to hit Madison Bumgarner. Well, I don't know about hitting Madison Bumgarner, but uh, did you hear what the, uh, what the announcer said as the shadow passed over the field? The lights went out. How many of that has ever happened to you? Maybe not necessarily with a blimp, but you're out on a bright sunny day and on by, and you're in the shadow of the plane for a second or two, and it does get kind of dark. And then just as quickly, it gets bright again. That's what happened on that day with that playoff game several years ago. Now, I'm going to show you a somewhat similar picture, and yet similar but different. Here we go. This time, not a baseball field, but our planet Earth, seen from 250 miles above the Earth's surface from the now defunct Mir Russian space station. This was August of 1999, looking down on Europe, and that big dark blotch you see there, that's not the shadow of a blimp, that's the shadow of the moon. And for folks who were in that shadow, the lights went out for not two seconds or so, but more than two minutes as a total eclipse of the sun was visible wherever the shadow passed on but to the basics of a solar eclipse. The Earth casts the shadow out into space. It goes out for about a million miles. And in fact, we're turned into the point of the moon's orbit where the moon is circling. Earth's shadow is about 5,000 miles in 2,000 miles. So there's no problem on occasion of getting the moon complete Earth. Now, the moon doesn't shine by on its own. It shines by reflected sunlight. So if we remove the sunlight, the moon will completely and totally disappear when it's in the shadow, right? Well, not necessarily. Because when the moon moves into the Earth's shadow, and when it's totally covered, for some reason, it lights up. It lights up a kind of a coppery red or orange color. What's causing that? Why is that? It happens because of our atmosphere. You've noticed, I'm sure, during the daytime when the sun is high, high in the sky, sunlight is actually um, not white. It's actually a combination of all the colors of the rainbow. And when the sun is high in the sky, its rays uh, shining down on you take a shorter route. Those are short wavelengths, which tilt more toward the blue end of the spectrum. And with tiny particulate matter, little dust particles in the atmosphere, bouncing off those 
short wavelengths, that produces a blue color to the sky. That's why the sky is blue. Uh, it's called Raleigh scattering, if you want the official terminology. But then when the sun goes down toward the western horizon, or when it's first coming up in the east, along the rim of the horizon, the sky seems to turn a yellow or orange or even a reddish color. That's because now when the sun is down near the horizon, its wavelength of light is much longer. It's tilting more toward those orange and red colorations. And so that's why during the evening or morning hours, you get a reddish coloration to the sky. Now, lunar eclipses occur when the Earth gets between the sun and the moon, blocks out the light from the sun from reaching the moon. The moon goes into the shadow, and again, it gets blacked out, but not necessarily. Because if you were on the moon, looking up at the sky and looking up at the sun, you would see the Earth passing in front of the sun, and the Earth is four times bigger than the moon, so it would be a disk four times bigger than the moon appears from here on the Earth. And instead of blacking out the moon, what happens is that because of the atmosphere, uh, what's happening is that the sunlight is, is, is backlighting the atmosphere, so to speak. And the color that we're seeing around the immediate edge of the Earth is a ruddy or reddish coloration. That's the same red and orange you see at sunrise and sunset. And because the atmosphere acts like a lens, it bends that red light into the shadow and that red light falls on the moon when the moon is completely immersed in the shadow of the Earth. And so that's what happens during a total eclipse of the moon, as was the case with Columbus uh, and the Jamaican natives. They watched as the moon had a bite taken out of it. The bite gets larger and larger and larger. And then when the moon was completely in the shadow, it lit up with a kind of a, a, a reddish or coppery glow. Columbus may have even have told the natives that the moon was now smeared with blood and uh, you, you imagine how crazy that made the natives back then. But after totality ended, the moon started moving out of the shadow. The red light disappeared. And after another hour or so, the moon resumed its normal guise in the sky and remained its normal self. That is something that we will all be able to enjoy next year. Write this down if you have a chance. March 14th, 2025. Less than a year from now, it'll be the moon's turn to undergo a total eclipse, and the range of visibility is going to be fairly large. It turns out whenever the moon is in the shadow of the Earth, wherever the moon happens to be above the horizon, that's where the eclipse is going to be visible from. So we're talking about half the world, the night side of the Earth, half the globe will be turned toward the moon next year on March 14th, and that half happens to be the Western Hemisphere. North America, South America, over a billion people, weather conditions permitting, will have an opportunity to see next year a total eclipse of the moon. So again, write that down on your calendar. Total eclipse of the moon, March 14th of next year. Now we turn to eclipses of the sun. Have you ever noticed that the sun and the moon in the sky appear to be pretty much the same size? Now you know that doesn't seem to make any sense, right? After all, you know that the moon, uh, that the sun is so many times larger than the moon. In fact, I'll tell you how many times, 400 times the diameter of the moon. So the moon is a puny 2,000 miles or so wide. The sun is almost a million miles wide. But yet the moon seems to be the same size as the sun is seen from here on the Earth. How can that be? Well, okay, the moon may be 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's also only a quarter of a million miles away. The sun is 93 million miles away. And guess what? That turns out to be 400. The moon, 400 times smaller, is also 400 times closer to us as, a, as opposed to the sun. And so that allows the moon to seem in the sky to be about the same size as the sun. Well, actually, it's not exactly the same size. You see, the moon takes... 28 days to move in its orbit around the Earth. And when the moon is uh, traveling around the Earth, it's traveling in an elliptical orbit. So, um, or an oval-shaped orbit. There are times when the moon is at one point in its orbit that it's at what we call perigee, closest to the Earth. At that point, it's 221,000 miles away. But then two weeks later, it's on the other side of its orbit, the far point of its orbit, apogee, then it's 253,000 miles away. So there's a difference between the near and far points in the moon's orbit of about 32,000 miles. 
and that uh, variation amounts to about 12 or 13 percent. So in the sky, you see the moon actually changing size. It's almost pulsing, if you will, over a span of a month's time. And when the moon, for example, is at full phase and near the far point of its orbit, apogee, it appears about 12 or 13 percent smaller than when it's at its near point, perigee. And in fact, the news media has branded a full moon at perigee as the super moon, because again, it's again, 12 or 13% bigger than it is when it's at the far point of its orbit. This plays a very important role in the science of eclipses, because let's say that you place the moon at the far point of its orbit, about 250,000 miles away, and you place it at a point where it's going to pass directly between the sun and the earth. Now the two shadows that the moon throws, the penumbra, the uh, area where the partial eclipse is visible, about 6,000 miles in diameter, that reaches the Earth. But look at this. This is the dark umbra shadow. Inside of the dark cone you see here is where you see a total eclipse of the sun. But because the moon is far from the Earth on this occasion, again, 250,000 miles or so away, look what happens. The cone tapers off, gets tapers and gets smaller and smaller, shorter, shorter. And finally, it tapers to a tip, and the tip of the shadow never touches the Earth. It passes a few hundred, sometimes a few thousand miles above the surface of the Earth. So there's no contact with the dark shadow of the Earth, of the, of the moon, with the Earth. And so what would you see if you were in that area in the, in the ocean, in that red zone? What would be? You would see the dark silhouette of the moon. And you would see around the moon, because the moon, again, is too far to cover the sun completely, you would see a ring of sunlight around the dark edge of the moon. An annular eclipse, not an annual. An annual, of course, would mean it comes every year. But annular, derived from the Latin, is a ring eclipse. And back in October of last year, we had just such an eclipse move across the United States, the western and southern United States. And everybody who was in this zone, which was about 130 miles wide in this path, saw the sun go from bright and sunny and morphed into a ring of fire in the sky. And, you know, people hearing about that from, you know, surrounding states, oh, we've got to see that. We've got, that that's a great thing to see. And so on the day of the eclipse, there were highways and byways leading into the eclipse zone, jam-packed with people trying to see that unusual sight. And here it is. There is the ring eclipse. You know what I call this? I call this the penny on nickel eclipse. Look in your pocket for a penny and a nickel. Pretend the nickel is the sun. Pretend the penny is the moon. Now I challenge you, cover up the nickel with the penny. You can't because the penny is smaller than the nickel. The best you can do is you can line both of them up exactly and you'd have a ring of nickel around the copper penny. Well, that's what happens during an annular eclipse. When the moon is too far away to cover the sun, it's too small uh, to cover it completely, and you get that ring of fire in the sky. Now, admittedly, this is quite spectacular. It's very interesting. But when you compare this to a total eclipse, when the moon is large enough to completely cover the sun, it's like a whole new ball game. It literally is like comparing day and night. But that's what happened in October of last year. The moon was too far to cover the sun, the shadow didn't reach the earth, and we had a ring of fire. But one week from this coming Monday, once again, the moon is going to pass between the sun and the earth. And this time, the moon is going to be about 25,000 miles closer to the earth as opposed to last October. So this time, that dark cone of shadow will make it all the way down to the earth. And when it touches the earth, Anybody who happens to be under it or along the path that that shadow takes across the Earth's surface will see the great spectacle of a total solar eclipse. Now, those of you of a certain age, such as yours truly, you may remember when you were much younger, uh, a solar eclipse. It occurred on a Saturday afternoon way back in 1970, on March the 7th, to be precise. This was the New York Times the next day, the front page, showing a view of the eclipse, the sequence of the total eclipse. Here in New York, this eclipse was almost total. 
the path of the eclipse passed, oh, about oh, 75 miles to our south and east out over the ocean. The millions who watched here saw for a few minutes when the sun was almost completely covered, an eerie counterfeit twilight that fell over the area. Very interesting, but it wasn't a total eclipse. But wait a minute, hold on for a second. So we had a total eclipse that just barely missed the New York metropolitan area. As I said, it went up along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Hmm, that's interesting. And the year was 1970. Do you remember that cycle that I mentioned to you earlier? And I asked you to remember a specific number. That was the exeglimos, the triple saros, the turning of the wheel. And through three saros cycles, the earth turns again, 120 degrees. So after three turns, the shadows pass almost directly over the same region of the world that it did. When? Where's that number? 54. 54 years and 32 days uh, ago, we had an eclipse very similar uh, to what we're going to be seeing now in a week or so. And that exactly works out just right for uh, this cycle. In 1970, March the 7th, here was the eclipse track. Look at this now. It, uh, the total eclipse started in the Pacific Ocean. Then it curved to the north and east, up across Mexico. It passed just to the west of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, across the Gulf of Mexico, into northern Florida, the southeastern United States, off the mid-Atlantic coast, Look at that. Look at that. It missed New York by, again, about 75 miles. If it had been 75 miles further to the north and west, New York would have seen a total eclipse of the sun, but we didn't. We saw almost a total eclipse. The shadow track passed over Nantucket Island in Massachusetts, across Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and then ended at sundown over the North Pacific Ocean. North Atlantic Ocean, I should say. So now, Let's add 54 to 1970. That brings us to 2024. That's this year. Let's add 32 days to March 7th. That takes us to April the 8th, one week from this Monday. And there you go. Like, almost like magic, right? But once again, the sequence of events, the cycle of the exeglimos, the 54 plus year cycle, brings the shadows back to the same part of the globe as was the case in 1970, although this time, whereas the shadow starts over the Pacific Ocean, it moves across Mexico, but far, far away from the Yucatan Peninsula. In fact, so far inland that it's going to pass over Texas, the Tennessee River, and Ohio River Valley, up into the eastern Great Lakes, upstate New York, northern New England, again over Atlantic Canada, Newfoundland, and then finishes out over the North Atlantic Ocean. And here is an animation of what's going to happen. Here you see the penumbra, the big shadow where the partial eclipse is visible, 6,000 or so miles wide. And in the middle of the penumbra, did you see that black dot? That black dot is the umbral shadow. That's the zone where the eclipse is going to be total. It's about 125 miles wide. And look, moving across Mexico and up into the southern and eastern part of the United States, and anywhere along the path of that dark zone, we'll show it to you one more time, we'll see totality. The rest of the United States and the rest of North America will see a partial eclipse of the sun that day. Take a look. Here we go. Here is the band of the total eclipse. And look at this. This shows you the duration. Usually, in many cases, a total eclipse will last a minute or two. This one is special. This one, because the moon is so close to the Earth, is going to last four minutes and 28 seconds of totality in Mexico. And even when it moves up and diminishes into the northern part of the United States, it's still going to last about, oh, three and a half minutes, almost four minutes in some cases. So this is going to be a very special eclipse. And it's passing over the Empire State, our state. Come for the eclipse. That's what the uh, committee, the I Love New York committee is saying. It's trying to get, uh, you know, other states around us to say, you know, you can see the eclipse elsewhere. You can see it in Texas. But why don't you come to New York? Come to New York. Come for the eclipse and stay for New York. The New York total solar eclipse. That's what uh, Governor Hochul and uh, the I Love New York Committee people are calling this. And here is the path of the total eclipse. From between these two lines, the yellow line and the dark gray line, that's the band or 
path of totality. It's about 123 miles wide. This path, the total eclipse path, is where it's going to last the longest. In some cases, in excess of three minutes and 45 seconds. Wow. So people who live in Cleveland, Ohio, Erie, Pennsylvania, Buffalo. I mean, I tell you, I don't know many things that would entice me to go to Buffalo, especially in the winter when they have all that snow. But here's something that would entice me to come, a total eclipse of the sun. Or go to Rochester, New York. Syracuse is inside the southern edge, so they're going to get about a minute and a half of totality. But Watertown is right on the center line, and Plattsburgh, New York, Burlington, Vermont. And you go all the way up further into northern New England. And in fact, the biggest city in Canada, Montreal, is also going to be in the total eclipse path. Now, I want to tell you something. Scientists, astronomers spend a lot of time and spend a lot of money sometimes to get into that zone of total. They're not rare. Let me point this out. Total eclipses of the sun are not rare. They happen on average once every 18 months somewhere on this planet. But when they do happen, that have very few people like Antarctica. I was in Antarctica for the last total eclipse in December of 2021. You see how crazy I am to travel all the way down there to just to see the sun black out for a few minutes, right? <laughs> uh, how about Mongolia or Siberia or Patagonia? Usually when these eclipses occur about every 18 months, they are sparsely populated. My goodness, the next one after this in August of 2026, go to Iceland or Greenland if you want to see that total eclipse. And here, here is an eclipse now, a total eclipse that's going to happen literally right at your back door. I mean, all you have to do on that Monday is get in your car and travel north up along Interstate 87. Once you get past Albany, it becomes the Adirondack Northway. Travel on the Northway past Saratoga Springs and up into the Adirondacks. And looky, you're in totality. You are in the zone where the eclipse will be total. I mean, think about that. Scientists and astronomers travel and spend a lot of money to get into that zone all over the world. And here you are just four or five hours away by car from the greatest spectacle that you will ever see in your lifetime. Now, if you stay here in the New York area, this is what's going to happen. At 325 that afternoon, the eclipse is going to reach a maximum. 91% of the sun is going to get covered by the moon. That, you say, yourself, well, Joe, 91%, that's good enough for me. No, it's not. Because that 9% of sun that's still remaining is still going to be bright enough to make it pretty much like a daytime sky. Oh, it'll get a little darker. And in fact, I, you want to use this analogy. Get a flashlight and put three brand new uh, alkaline batteries in the flashlight and then turn it on and look at the flashlight. It's b almost blinding, right? The light shines so brightly. It's so white bright. But now put three batteries in that flashlight that have been half used and then now turn on the light. It's not going to blind you like it was when the batteries are, are new. Uh, the light will still come on, but it'll look kind of like more of a yellowish color and much dimmer. That's what's going to happen locally here on uh, a week from Monday. This, you're going to walk out and at maximum eclipse 325, it may be sunny, but it, it looks strange. It, it, the sun looks weaker, if you will. Sunlight looks weaker, and it may even look a bit yellower than usual. And again, it's, it's, it's going to be strange with that much of the sun covered. Again, an interesting sight, but you're missing the point. The main show, the big show, is when you go into totality, when you go into the zone of the total eclipse, because it is the total eclipse that is so absolutely phenomenal. Take it from me. I've been to 13 of them. The moon appears first to move slowly between us and the sun. At first, it appears to be just a small bite taken out of one side of the sun, and then the bite gets larger and larger. The sky begins to dim, and you begin to understand why these moments were so terrifying to early man. Now, just like in New York, we see the crescent, blinding crescent images of the sun, and then the sun shines only through the craters and mountains on the moon. And then, finally, the cosmic vision of a lifetime, a total eclipse of the sun. Only the outer atmosphere of the sun is visible now. The incredible corona suddenly flashes out into the heavens. And let me tell you, even the stodgiest of astronomers who have experienced this moment of an eclipse speak of it in awe. On that second Monday in April, tens of millions of people 
are going to get a rare chance to see it for themselves. Then, after four minutes or so, the cosmic sequence reverses itself, the sun flashes back into our line of sight, the total eclipse is over. And unless you plan to do some long-distance traveling to catch an eclipse somewhere else in this world of ours, that probably, for most people, will be your one and only chance of seeing a total eclipse of the sun. Now, some of the associated things that occurred with a total eclipse. You've looked into the sky and you've seen the stars twinkle, right? It's not the stars, though, that are twinkling. It's the light from the star interacting with the Earth's atmosphere, interacting with the moving, moving pockets of cool and warm air, the turbulence which causes the star light to scintillate, so to speak. Now, does the sun scintillate? No, of course not. The sun is a disk. It's a star, but it's much too big to scintillate. However, in the final minute or so before totality, when it is down to just a narrow filament or hairline of light in the sky, that's when the atmosphere does its job. The atmosphere works on that thin sliver of sunlight and down on the ground and on surrounding things like, like local houses, you see these bands of shadow, rippling bands that are traveling rapidly across the ground and across uh, the, the, the your, your nearby homes, shadow bands. And it's an amazing sight to see. Again, just before the eclipse hits total totality, that's what you see, these strange ripples of shadow, only, again, uh, when you're in the zone of a total eclipse. And the beautiful uh, appearance of the solitaire of light interacting with the innermost part of the corona, just as the total phase is about to begin or just as it's coming to an end. In 1925, Jul January of 1925, and my grandfather, used to tell me about this because he remembers this from when he was 16 years old. A total eclipse passed over New York of the sun's moon, the, the southern edge of the dark shadow of 6th Street. So everybody who lived north of 96th Street, in Upper Manhattan, the Bronx, the uh, lower Hudson Valley, all those folks in this zone got a chance to see the great spectacle of a total eclipse of the sun. But the folks who didn't travel that far north, who stayed south of 96th Street, in Midtown or Lower Manhattan or Brooklyn or Staten Island, they did not see that. What they saw was the sun narrow down to a very thin crescent and see one little blob of light lingering and lingering for many seconds. And then finally that blob uh, got more intense as the moon moved on and the uh, eclipse, the maximum part of the eclipse ended. But what they saw in the sky was a, a beautiful solitaire of light, the innermost part of the corona, and people later who did not venture into totality said, my goodness, why didn't the scientists tell us about this? We saw uh, it, it, it looked like a, 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 an engagement. No, and they missed out on telling us that. The next day, the New York Times had to get an astronomer to explain what exactly the folks south of 96th Street saw. And in that article, this was mentioned as spontaneously being called Diamond Ring by the numbers of observers in diamond ring unknown hitherto unknown to astronomy was apparently fixed as forever as a technical term in the literature of the subject by the term diamond ring effect for an eclipse that got started here in new york 99 years ago we didn't get quite into the zone of totality noted the astronomer that the times hired to a uh, answer what it was uh, dr henry norris russell uh, it is a beautiful and perfect description of the effect this picture was taken by one of my close friends, one of my best friends. In fact, I was with him in 1979 in Montana during totality. During the middle of the total eclipse, this is what we saw. We saw a sky that darkened to the equivalent of about 40 minutes after sunrise or 40 minutes before, 40 minutes after sunset or 40 minutes before sunrise. So you, you, the next clear night that we have, the next clear day when you can watch the sunset, wait 40 minutes and then 40 minutes later, the darkness of that sky will be the equivalent of what you would normally see when you're plunged into the shadow, the dark shadow of the moon and uh, witnessing a total solar eclipse. Dark enough so that you can actually see stars and planets suddenly appear. What was once daytime just a few moments before, now it's about two, three o'clock in the afternoon, and here it is, a, a, a dark sky, and you're able to see in this upcoming occasion, a week from Monday, uh, to the lower right of the sun will be the planet Venus, and to the far to the upper left of the sun will be Jupiter. 
And that's what you'll be, be looking for, as well as the beautiful corona. This is always around the sun, but you never see it because of the blindingly bright sunlight. But when the moon completely covers all of the sun, the corona just flares out into view suddenly. Uh, a great crown, a halo, the corona of the sun, streaming outward, ragged at the edge, streaks running through it. And again, before and after you get to see the diamond ring, oh, it is just an absolutely gorgeous event to, to witness. Now, the liability part of my talk. Don't, don't look directly at the sun during the partial phases of the eclipse. Especially don't do what this fool did and use his telescope to point out. You know, you know how many people think that it's the eclipse that's dangerous? I once took a phone call on behalf of the Hayden Planetarium in New York. A guy calls up and he says, yeah, I know about the eclipse tomorrow. I said, yes, sir. He says, can you tell me when uh, the eclipse is going to end? So I looked it up and I said, the eclipse is going to come to an end tomorrow at 2.54 p.m. 2.54. All right. Let me write that down. 2.54. He said, and I honest, honest to God, this is what the guy said. He said, so after 2.54, I can look at the sun, right? No, no, you don't look at the sun at any time. It's not the eclipse that's dangerous. It's the sun that's dangerous all the time. So if you want to watch this eclipse, what do you do? How do you do it? If you have a telescope, for example, here's what you got to do. You point the telescope at the sun. Don't look through the eyepiece. You point the telescope at the sun and then project the image of the sun, the enlarged image, I might add, onto a piece of paper or cardboard serving as your screen, which will show an image of the sun and the eclipse, just like these people are doing. They had a telescope. Uh, the, the gentleman here actually put kind of a shade that was also in the diagram. The shade casts a shadow on the screen, but also allows you to see the uh, image of the sun a little bit better. And it's an enlarged image. And look at this, not just one person, but several people can look at this enlarged view of the sun by projection. Or if you don't have a telescope, but you have binoculars, mount the binoculars on a tripod like this young lady did. And she is looking at a double view of the sun and the, the beginnings of a of a solar eclipse, see the bite down here. Or kids love to do this. They love to make pinhole boxes. You get a large corrugated cardboard box and you make a hole on one side of the box, cover the hole with aluminum foil, poke a hole through the aluminum foil and allow sunlight to pass through the hole and onto a screen on the opposite side of the box. And you get a small image of the partially eclipsed sun, a safe image to look at. Kids are doing that here, either with the box or if you don't have a box, you can use two pieces of cardboard or paper, punch a hole in one of the paper and uh, or cardboard and let the hole shine, uh, the sun shine through the hole onto a second sheet. If you don't have a telescope, binoculars or a box, you have a tree, use a tree. Trees that are in leaf uh, have little uh, spaces in between the leaves that act as pinholes, which like the pinhole in the box, uh, go through and fall onto the ground and you get dozens, scores, hundreds of images of the eclipse dappling the ground beneath the tree. If you don't have a tree or a box or a telescope or binoculars, you have a cracker. I mean, use a cracker for goodness sake. Uh, you got a Ritz cracker or a saltine cracker, let the sun shine through the holes in the cracker. And sure enough, on a second sheet of paper, uh, using it as your screen, you get multiple images of what's happening up in the sky. Again, another safe way of looking at the eclipse or a mirror. Have the sunlight bounce off of a mirror, for goodness sake. Don't look directly at the uh, reflected image in the mirror, but what you do is the image hits the mirror of the sun and then bounce it off 30, 40, 50 feet away onto a screen, and look, you've got an image of the sun right here on the, uh, on the screen there. So you get another chance to see the eclipse uh, in a safe manner, safe way. And eclipse glasses, these are becoming increasingly popular. By all means, make sure that you uh, get a hold of uh, these eclipse glasses. I know many libraries are giving these out to their patrons, and uh, certainly if uh, they're available, uh, you should get a uh, hold of them. They are not sunglasses, by the way. They are not sunglasses. If you have a pair of sunglasses and you say, I'll look at the eclipse through the sunglass because the sunglass is really dark. Well, that may very well be. You may very well attenuate or diminish the light of the sun so that you can see it through the sunglasses, but the infrared and ultraviolet radiations of the sun are coming straight through that sunglass 
and your eyes are being burned because your eyes do not have sensors and they're being burned without you immediately being aware of it. So don't use sunglasses, but these special solar eclipse glasses do have the ability of knocking down the light of the sun and also blocking off the infrared and the ultraviolet radiation so that it is safe to look at. And if you can't get them at a library, uh, you can get them on Amazon. You can order them online. They're only they're not going to set you back more than a couple of bucks. You can even get a four pack for what? Uh, um, a uh, 10 or $12. But this is the way to watch the partial phases. So if you can't get a solar, solar eclipse glasses, uh, Linus here, uh, many years ago during an eclipse, Linus uh, in a uh, story arc uh, in Peanuts was telling all the uh, characters about um, uh, how to watch properly an eclipse of the sun. Linus was the voice of reason. And so he's telling all of his friends, you don't use photographic negatives. You don't use sunglasses. You don't use smoke glass. Welder's glass, he even said that's unsafe, but not necessarily true. If you can go to a welding supply store, or a hardware store that sells welder's goggles. You can use them, but you need the right shade or safety plate in the glass. Um, the, the, the number you need to ask for is shade number 13. If you get a shade that's higher number, like 14 or 15, the sun appears too dim to appreciate. If it's lower than 13, the sun appears too bright, and uh, you really shouldn't look at a very bright image of the sun with a shade 10 or 12 or eight or six. 13 is the Goldilocks shade. 13 will allow you to look safely at the sun and it blocks off both the sunlight and the infrared and the ultraviolet rays. And the reason why I made the font green is that that's what you'll see through a welder's glass. You'll see a green sun. So that's an interesting way of watching the eclipse. This got me very angry when Charles Schultz uh, had the Peanuts characters, Linus, say this to his friends. There is no safe method for looking directly at an eclipse, and it's especially dangerous when it's a total eclipse. Linus, wrong, 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 because when the eclipse is total, now it's not going to be total here in New York. You'll need to use the glasses and projection apparatus all through the entire eclipse. But if you venture up to Buffalo, to Syracuse, to Rochester, to Plattsburgh, to Watertown, any of the places that are in the zone of the total eclipse, when the sun is in totality, that's when you can take the glasses off. That's when you can uh, throw away the projection apparatus. That is when you can look at the sun directly with your eyes, and especially so if you have binoculars or a telescope, but only during the total phase of the eclipse. That is when it's safe. When the sun is emerging from out of totality, back go the glasses on uh, your eyes. But uh, just before totality, you can take the glasses off as watch the diamond ring effect and into totality you go. And then after the totality is ended, that's when you have to uh, protect your eyes <clears throat> once again. Now, I'm going to show you a snippet of a film. It's going to last for about three minutes. It's a, it's a dated film. It goes back over 50 years, but I still insist that you watch it because it gives you the flavor. It gives you the, it pr pr provides the emotion, so to speak, of what happens when you see a total solar eclipse, and especially so with other people. In 1972, a cruise company uh, decided that they were going to dedicate an entire week of a cruise to a total eclipse that was going to be out in the ocean, out in the Atlantic Ocean. They sailed out of New York. They went out into the Atlantic. They intercepted the path of the total eclipse out over the Atlantic Ocean, and 800 people men, women, children, families, even the crew on the ship. They all stopped and watched the total phase of the eclipse. Now, what you're going to see are people who are going to be projecting the image of the sun with their telescopes. Special glasses were handed out to watch the partial phases, and then comes totality. The film is made all the more dramatic by the music. If you're a classical music uh, person, you recognize the music as the Seasons by Alexander Glosnoff, the perfect music to accompany the occurrence of a total solar eclipse. And I have to scroll to find the spot in the movie that, uh, I'm not going to show you the whole movie, but I just want to show you uh, totality. And so I'm going to do that right now. Let me scroll. I think it's right about, right about 
Here. And the eclipse is about ready to begin right now. above us, like a phenomenal photograph pasted on the dome of the sky. How much alien stimulation can a mind process in just a little over a minute? You might have been waiting so intently for the first diamond ring that you missed seeing the shadow bands a number of passengers reported. Or you might have glanced away from the brilliant diamond ring and missed the elusive Bailey's beads as the last of the sun's limbs slipped behind the mountains of the moon. The corona might have so hypnotized you that your eyes did not stray far enough to show you the winter star Procyon or the planet Mercury. You might have missed a great deal if you were among those searching within the orbit of Mercury for undiscovered objects. But how worth it if you found a comet or a new planet? No one saw it all. We had to compare notes with other observers to piece together a chronicle of that sensational minute. A slow photographic exposure could show all but the subtle streamers of the outer corona. A fast one could capture prominences, explosions of gas many times the size of the Earth that were arrayed along an upper limb of the sun. 
so much of it could not be photographed. And yet everyone knew that with each successive eclipse, photographic technology had advanced. And this time, more could be recorded than last time. But the cold wind, the gentle rocking of the ship, the sounds, the shouts, the companionship, were forever outside the province of photography. Time was not standing still. Now it seemed as if a minute had been not stretched, but lost out of time. After the spectacular instant of the third contact diamond ring, it was over. Having been on several eclipse cruises before, I, I, that really captures the moment. And please, please don't follow Charlie Brown's suggestion. He asked Linus, he says, how would your ophthalmologist feel if I just closed my curtains and stayed in bed all day? Don't do that. If you're still going to be down here for the partial eclipse, try to see that. But if I had the opportunity, if I had the power to drag every single one of you who is listening to this right now into this zone of totality, I would do it. I'm going to finish off with three quotes, one from the 19th, one from the 20th, and one from the 21st century. Uh, the first quote, uh, after experiencing a total eclipse for the first time in his life in 1851, the respected British astronomer Edwin Duncan spoke for most of us who have seen a total eclipse when he declared, few can imagine how much I longed for just another minute of what I had witnessed. But what I had just seen seemed very much like a dream. In the 20th century, a good friend of mine, the late Leif Robinson, former editor-in-chief of Sky and Telescope magazine, stated it more simply and succinctly. He said, no one should pass through life without seeing at least once a total solar eclipse. I leave the final quote to one of my oldest and dearest friends, astronomer Glenn Schneider, who has traveled the world I've seen 13 total eclipses. Glenn beats me by a mile. He once said, Joe, 13 is nice, but you're just a piker. Glenn has seen 35 total eclipses. He's traveled the world to see them. He's in the Guinness Book of Records uh, for seeing more total eclipses than anyone else. And it was Glenn who once said, if you want to experience the ultimate in human emotion, curiosity, and imagination, then go see a total eclipse of the sun. Even if you're poor, starving, in hock, in trouble with the law, unbalanced, and totally addicted, see it anyway, because it's worth it. I uh, went a bit longer than I normally would, but I, I know that tonight we have um, a special audience. Uh, I usually do with my uh, colleague and good friend Joe Chiaffi, meteorologist Joe Chiaffi, a show on the internet, which all of you are invited to watch most weeknights. And I give Joe uh, top billing there. It's called the Joe and Joe Show. <laughs> and anyway, we, Joe has arranged and managed to have our normal group of people. And we have a hardcore group of many uh, weather enthusiasts, which tonight uh, is tuned in to this particular uh, broadcast and this particular lecture about the upcoming solar eclipse. So we thought we'd do something special tonight for that. But I want to thank you all for uh, coming and listening 
And if you have any questions that uh, you'd like answered about what you saw, um, you know, wh whatever you want, want, I'd be very happy to answer them. All you need to do is just, just uh, unmute yourself or post on the chat board. Thank you, Lynn, for your comment on the chat board. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll be very happy right now to answer whatever you, whatever you uh, have, uh, whatever you saw or anything about uh, eclipses in general. Well, I must have did a did a very good job. I did a thorough job because there doesn't seem to be anybody with any questions or anything. Um, somebody on Ling Gonzalez says, "Where would be the closest place to travel to see it?" Well, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, when I mentioned earlier in the talk, if you start from New York City, you get on the Major Deegan Expressway, which is Interstate 87, and just stay on 87 all the way to the north, past Albany, past Saratoga Springs, and when you get to the town of Shroon Lake. Uh, which is at the base of the southern end of the Adirondacks. That's, again, about a four-hour trip from New York, maybe more like maybe four and a half or five hours. But still, from there, north, that's where you'll get into the zone of totality, and that will be where you can see the total eclipse. Um, again, the cities in New York State that will be in the zone of the eclipse will be Niagara Falls, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, um, Plattsburgh, Watertown, New York, all of those cities uh, will be in the uh, zone of the total eclipse. If you go online and type in online, uh, Google uh, Great American Total Eclipse, or just type in April 8, 2024, you'll come, up, come up with a number, many, many, many uh, websites which will give you all the information you would want on how to photograph it, how to look at it, maps, charts, and whatever. And I've just got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping for everybody uh, that you get a chance. We have good weather on that day so that you'll get a chance to see this great spectacle, uh, a total solar eclipse. All right, I'm going to, we're going to wrap it up. So that's it. So, anyway, I'm sorry about that, folks. I'm just trying to run two audio streams at once. Um, you know, 90 minutes here. So, I think we're just going to uh, end the show right now. And uh, Joe and I will be back tomorrow night at tomorrow night's at 8 o'clock. Okay. I think. Uh, I'll double check. I'll put up the schedule up tomorrow to make sure I got the right time. All right. Everybody have a great, uh, great night and uh, we'll see you tomorrow.